My name is Daniel Hawthorne, a sophomore at a university that prides itself more on its ancient architecture and ivy-covered walls than the well-being of its students. It was during the heart of autumn, when the leaves painted the campus in fiery hues, that my tale of dread began. I've always been keenly observant, perhaps too much for my own good, noticing shadows where others saw light, and silence where others heard laughter. My days were routine, filled with the monotony of lectures, the soft hum of the library, and the occasional coffee with friends who were more acquaintances than anything else. I prided myself on being unnoticed, a shadow among brighter lights, until the day I felt eyes on me. It was a sensation that clawed at the edges of my consciousness, turning every whisper of the wind into a breath on my neck. Despite my efforts, I could never catch more than the briefest glimpses of someone lingering just a bit too long in my periphery. This sense of being watched grew from a whisper to a scream within me, disrupting my sleep and turning every shadow into a potential harbinger of my demise. It was during one particularly lonely walk back from the library, the night cloaked around me like a second skin, that I received the first message. I see you, it read, a simple text from an unknown number that felt like ice water down my spine. I reported it to the university police, expecting concern, expecting action. Instead, I was met with dismissive nods and assurances that kids play pranks all the time. Their apathy stung, but it was the beginning of a pattern. More messages arrived, each more invasive than the last. I know what you did last summer, one read, a blatant lie since my summers were spent in the dullest of ways, but it was the threat behind the words that terrified me. My isolation became my fortress and my prison. Friends, noticing my increasing withdrawal and paranoia, drifted away, assuming I was succumbing to some unfounded hysteria. Even I began to question my sanity, wondering if the stress of academia was prying at the edges of my mind. But then the gifts started arriving, a dead bird left at my door, a photo of me sleeping, taken from just outside my window. It was undeniable proof that my fears were grounded in a chilling reality. The police, once again, offered no solace, suggesting I had attracted an unwanted admirer who would tire in time. Their indifference was a cold reminder of my solitude in this struggle. With each passing day, the line between safety and peril blurred, leaving me adrift in a sea of anxiety and dread. It was clear I was on my own. To protect myself, I began to delve into the art of observation, not just as a passive recipient, but as an active participant. I needed to uncover the identity of my stalker before their next act escalated beyond the realm of threatening gestures. Little did I know, the path I embarked upon would lead me into the darkest corners of the human psyche, challenging everything I believed about fear, survival, and the unseen menace that stalked me from the shadows. As autumn waned, and the chill of winter began to creep across the campus. My life became a series of precautions and rituals designed to protect myself from the unseen predator that haunted my every step. My dorm room transformed into a sanctuary, albeit a claustrophobic one, with taped windows to prevent prying eyes and multiple locks on the door that clicked shut like the chambers of a gun each night. The messages and gifts became more sinister, each one a grotesque parody of affection. A lock of hair, not mine, tied with a red ribbon. A series of photographs chronicling my daily routines, as if they were moments of intimate significance. With the police and university authorities still dismissively unconcerned, I turned to the internet, diving into the murky waters of cyber investigation in a desperate attempt to reclaim some semblance of control. It was during one long, caffeine-fueled night that I stumbled upon a forum for victims of stalking. Here, amidst the stories of terror and resilience, I found advice that would shape my next steps. I began documenting everything, creating a meticulous record of the stalking in hopes of building a case that even the most indifferent officer couldn't ignore. Yet, even as I armed myself with knowledge and evidence, the feeling of being hunted grew more oppressive, a psychological noose tightening with each passing day. I remember one evening, as the first snowfall blanketed the campus in silence, I saw a figure standing beneath the skeletal branches of an old oak tree outside my window. Shrouded in darkness, they were little more than a shadow, but I felt their gaze piercing through the glass, a tangible weight on my soul. I snapped a picture, 
but when I dared a second look, the figure was gone, as if they were never there. My academic performance suffered, my relationships crumbled, and my health deteriorated under the weight of constant fear. Yet, amidst this downward spiral, a flame of defiance began to kindle within me. I refused to be a passive victim to this torment. I began to take self-defense classes, carry pepper spray, and most importantly, I started to reach out to others, building a small network of friends and allies who believed my story and stood by me. One of these allies was Alex, a graduate student in psychology who became fascinated with my case. The mind of a stalker is driven by a need for power and control, Alex explained one evening over coffee, their voice a mixture of academic curiosity and genuine concern. Your stalker wants you isolated, afraid, dependent on the very attention they give you. By reaching out, by building this support system, you're already undermining their control. This new perspective was a revelation, a shift in the battle lines. It was not just a matter of enduring the stalking, but actively countering the psychological warfare being waged against me. Armed with this new understanding, I felt a renewed sense of purpose. My fear, while never fully dissipating, was now accompanied by a steely determination to expose and confront my tormentor. But with each step forward, the stalker seemed to escalate their efforts as if provoked by my resistance. The messages became threats, and the gifts turned gruesome. It was clear that what began as a twisted game was spiraling into something far more dangerous. I was no longer just fighting for my peace of mind. I was fighting for my life. The heart of winter held the campus in an icy grip, but the cold within me had little to do with the weather. It stemmed from the realization that my stalker was always one step ahead, a phantom just beyond the reach of light, their motives as obscured as their identity. My days were punctuated by bouts of paranoia and defiance, a relentless tug of war between succumbing to fear and the urge to stand my ground. One evening, as I was escorted home by a friend from one of my night classes, we found another gift waiting at my door. This time it was a book. Its pages hollowed out to nestle a single, chilling item, a knife its blade gleaming ominously under the hallway's flickering lights. It was a message that could not be ignored or rationalized away. My response, when it came, was visceral and immediate. With trembling hands, I called the police once again, this time refusing to be brushed aside. The arrival of the police marked a turning point. The severity of the situation was finally recognized, prompting an investigation that, while long overdue, was a beacon of hope in the pervasive darkness that had enveloped my life. Security measures were heightened around my dorm, and patrols increased, casting a net in the hopes of catching this predator who had terrorized me for months. Meanwhile, Alex and I delved deeper into the psychology of stalking, attempting to construct a profile of my tormentor. They're escalating, Alex noted grimly, poring over the timeline of incidents we had compiled. It's a sign of frustration, possibly due to your increased precautions and support, but it also means they might become reckless, make a mistake. It was a small comfort, but I clung to it. A lifeline in a sea of uncertainty. The investigation brought an uneasy truce with the fear that had become my constant companion. Knowing that every new piece of evidence brought the police closer to identifying my stalker provided a sense of momentum, a feeling that the nightmare might eventually end. Yet the shadow of danger never dissipated, hanging over me like a storm cloud, ready to burst. It was during this tense period of waiting and watching that I received a breakthrough. A friend, someone who had stood by me through my darkest days, came forward with a piece of information that would alter the course of the investigation. I saw someone, they whispered, a tremor in their voice betraying the fear that had gripped them. Taking pictures of your dorm, I didn't think much of it at the time, but now? Their hesitance was a mirror to my own apprehensions, a reflection of the dread that had become all too familiar. The description they provided was vague, yet it was enough for the police to work with, a thread in the web that had ensnared me. Surveillance footage from the area confirmed their account, capturing a figure that lingered in the shadows, their features obscured but their intent unmistakable. With this new lead, the investigation gained momentum, 
the once sluggish wheels of justice beginning to turn with renewed purpose. As the pieces began to fit together, a picture started to emerge, one that was both horrifying and vindicating. My stalker was closer than I had ever imagined, hiding in plain sight, their familiarity with my routines, and haunts a testament to their insidious presence in my life. The realization that I had unknowingly interacted with this person, had perhaps even considered them a friend or acquaintance, sent shivers down my spine. It was a betrayal of trust so profound it left me reeling. Yet within this storm of emotions, a fierce resolve took root. The end was in sight, a resolution within grasp. I was no longer a passive victim in this twisted game, but an active participant in my liberation from fear. The final confrontation was inevitable, a meeting that would either break me or free me from the chains of terror that had bound me for so long. The unraveling came not with a bang, but with the quiet click of pieces falling into place, an epiphany birthed in the dim light of my room, surrounded by the chaos of my investigation. The breakthrough didn't come from the police or an external rescue but from the very heart of my own relentless pursuit for the truth. It was hidden within the messages, the photos, everything Alex and I had poured over together, looking for the monster lurking in the shadows. The irony was, the monster had been sitting right next to me, guiding my gaze away from the truth. It started with a photo, one among many Alex had found, depicting me at a cafe supposedly taken by my stalker. But as I revisited it in my growing desperation, I noticed a reflection in the window, a figure taking the picture, obscured yet unmistakably present. It was a detail so minor, so easily overlooked, except for one damning feature, the unique, unmistakable watch on the photographer's wrist. A watch I had seen countless times, on Alex's wrist. My heart froze, not wanting to believe. Yet the evidence was as clear as the chill of realization that swept through me. How had I missed it? Alex, always there, always ready with an explanation, a theory, a comforting word. The perfect confidant, the perfect manipulator. My supposed ally in the shadows was the architect of my nightmares. Armed with this revelation, I knew I needed undeniable proof. Something concrete to shatter the meticulously crafted illusion Alex had woven around me. The opportunity came sooner than expected, under the guise of another late-night research session. This time, I directed our efforts, subtly steering Alex to revisit the digital footprints of our investigation. My hands shook as I worked the keyboard, pulling up the metadata of the emailed threats and photos, all the while Alex beside me, oblivious to the noose tightening. The breakthrough was as silent as it was damning. The digital signature, a unique identifier tied to the creation of the emails, matched a device registered to Alex. The moment stretched, taut with the unspoken truth between us as I turned to confront my betrayer. Alex's reaction was a mask of denial crumbling into desperation. The facade fell away, revealing not anger, but a twisted justification of actions driven by an obsession they framed as love. The confession was a raw, chaotic spill of emotion, revealing a psyche fractured by delusion and a distorted perception of our relationship. I recorded every word, every admission, my phone hidden away from sight, but capturing the unraveling of a mind lost to darkness. With the digital evidence in hand and the recorded confession securely on my phone, I took the decisive step of contacting the authorities. I could no longer bear the weight of this secret alone, nor did I trust myself to confront Alex without the law on my side. The evidence was meticulous, a testament to the months of fear, observation, and, ultimately, betrayal. It painted a damning picture of Alex, one that could not be easily dismissed or explained away. I emailed the files to the detective who had been assigned to my case, the one who had seen my distress but had little to work with until now. Along with the digital evidence, I included a detailed account of my discovery process, how each piece fit into the larger puzzle of Alex's deception. It was a careful, methodical dismantling of Alex's facade, laid bare for the authorities to see. The police response was swift, a stark contrast to the hesitancy that had characterized their earlier interventions. Armed with the evidence, they could no longer ignore the depth of my plight or the danger I was in. A meeting was arranged, conducted in the sterile environment of the police station, 
where I handed over my phone, the device now a key piece of evidence. The detectives listened, their expressions a mix of shock and grim determination as the recorded confession played, Alex's voice a stark admission of guilt. The realization that Alex had exploited their knowledge of psychology and their closeness to me to orchestrate this terror was a chilling moment of truth. The police assured me that with this evidence, they had a strong case, a pathway to ensuring Alex could no longer harm me or anyone else. It was a somber but necessary conclusion to a chapter of my life that had been dominated by fear and manipulation. As the winter thawed into spring, bringing with it a renewal of the world around me, I found myself standing on the cusp of a new beginning. The ordeal with Alex, while it had cast long shadows across my life, also illuminated my path with lessons of strength, resilience, and the importance of trusting my instincts. With each step forward, away from the darkness that had once seemed all-encompassing, I embraced the light of self-discovery and the promise of new horizons. The battle I had fought was not just for my survival, but for my spirit, which had emerged not only intact, but fortified. As I looked ahead, the future was no longer a landscape marred by fear, but a canvas awaiting the bold strokes of my continued journey. Mm -hmm.